Welcome to Season 5 of the Let's Talk Data podcast series presented by SAP, where we explore game-changing technologies with leading experts. Hi there. Welcome to the next in the series of Let's Talk Data. Today's podcast is titled SAP HANA Cloud Highlights, and we're going to be talking about extreme transaction processing and a whole new world of data lakes based on some exciting new technology that we're going to talk about today. So welcome to the series. Um, this series is brought to you by SAP experts, and we discuss topics around data and data management. Uh, our fan and I have done a, one or two of these in the past as well. My name is Neil McGovern, and I'll be hosting today's podcast. Today's podcast is focused on the cool new services that we've launched in April of this year for uh, SAP HANA Cloud. And to talk about these new services, joining me today is my old friend, Irfan Khan, uh, Global Head of SAP HANA and Analytics Development Organizations, run engineering for all the products we're going to talk about today and a lot more. So welcome, everybody else, and thank you very much for your time today. So Irfan, <laughs> hi there, how are you doing? I'm doing very well, and thank you, as always, for, uh, for for giving me the opportunity to meet with you and, of course, to reach many of our great and daring customers from the past and, of course, uh, you know, future opportunities for us to discuss the scope of, uh, of our offering as well. I mean, we've worked together in the database market for many decades. Uh, I don't know how many decades, but when you start measuring things in decades, it gets a little bit, uh, uh, well, it gets a little bit something. Um, we first met when you were CTO at Sybase. Uh, this is before SAP acquired Sybase in 2010. Um, so, you know, we've got a lot of history together and you've got a lot of background in the technology we're going to talk about today uh, because these new technologies are based on Sybase engines. So, it, you know, in April of this year, uh, we launched these three new HANA Cloud services uh, leveraging the Sybase technology. And we want to talk a little bit about how this is important to obviously existing Sybase customers, but we've talked to them uh, in an earlier session. But if you're a dormant customer, if you're somebody who's had Sybase in your um, landscape, you know, might be wondering what you can do with that and uh, bring it forward. Or this is important, even if you're not a Sybase customer, there's some of the things we're doing around extreme transaction processing and uh, data lakes that are going to be very interesting for you with this technology. So let's explore the value that these services can bring to uh, all SAP HANA Cloud customers. Um, and as I said, we're going to split the podcast into talking a little bit about extreme transaction processing, what that is and why it's important, and also then talking about the data lake capability. So let's focus first on extreme transaction processing. So Irfan, tell us a little bit about what extreme transaction processing is and why this announcement, why this new engine into HANA Cloud um, is important for our customers. Absolutely, uh, Neil. So maybe just to take a little bit of a historical tour here in answering your question, because I mean, whilst extreme transaction processing, the term is not necessarily new, uh, it's important to maybe just root ourselves in some of the history here to understand how we can take advantage of it in, in, a, in a variety of different systems landscapes today. So if I go back in time, and this is in the era of you and I working together in the Sybase uh, time frame, what we discovered was that for specific industries, and take maybe examples like capital markets, investment banking, those particular environments were regarded as being extreme transaction processing environments. And what were the hallmarks? Well, firstly, think about the high-end investment banking environments, right? Trading applications, as, as the case would be. And, and what tended to happen was, if you're a Goldman Sachs or if you're a JP Morgan Chase or a, a BlackRock, you actually were in need of constructing and building. In some instances, these are designed to engineered solutions, but sometimes these could be ISV-led solutions like a Murex or a Calypso providing the, the trading applications. But ultimately, what you needed was the ability to really pace the level of throughput that was needed for those extreme environments, like a trading environment. And what tended to happen is if you cast your memory back once again in the sort of the early to mid 2000s, when we went through that financial services crisis, we saw that suddenly trading volumes just went through the roof, right? Because everybody was trying to either sell short 
or they were trying to make uh, significant margins on on trying to do volumes of trades rather than large individual trades. And, and as a consequence, we saw a very substantial spike in transaction loads. So just imagine as you know the markets open, you know it's like 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. on the East Coast, and all the trading that's preceded that trading window, perhaps in Europe or in Asia, you suddenly had a, a very substantial reaction, right? Sometimes trading was either being driven by, you know, maybe a big announcement that was made or certain challenges that would the, you know, the market was facing generally. So you get a massive, spe you know, peak or a spike at that point in the day, and then things may be leveling out. And then ultimately, towards the end of the day, as you suddenly find in a trading day, for example, in those financial applications, you suddenly find that the market was getting, you know, getting close to, to a certain event again, and you get another you know, spike. So what you tended to find is that the extreme transactions that were occurring weren't necessarily constant throughout the day. But what that implied was that the runtime, the database in this particular case, which was ASE, needed to be able to scale to those peaks and those high peaks hence the notion of an extreme transactional load and not expecting the database to have to be retuned specifically for those peaks. It should just have to actually have the ability within the context of you know, whatever the day's activities were to deal with both the, the low points and midpoints and the high points. And this is really the, the hallmark that we saw from that era. Now, as we fast forward to present day, I mean, what would be regarded as maybe trading volumes for one particular customer in financial services they no longer have the monopoly on that because just imagine today's retailers and the e-commerce milestones that most large retailers are going through. You know, you could be a small, medium, large retailer and you're dealing with extreme volumes now. I mean, this could be COVID related. It could be because everybody's kind of doing a lot more online purchasing. It could be perhaps in clinical trials where you're looking at a lot more clinical, you know, maybe patient data. It could be in point of sale type of data in, in maybe market analysis. So you can imagine that industries have kind of expanded beyond just what capital markets was doing from an extreme load perspective. And every industry is now dealing with almost exactly the same requirements, hence why it's in, imperative now that you have a runtime that can keep up with those volumes. Yeah, it's, it's been very interesting. As you say, back in the day, it was for customers who had huge amounts of data and needed real-time response. And in the past, that used to be, you know, a few small industries. But guess what? You know, every industry now has a huge amount of data and needs to work in real time. So the engines that were built to handle these extreme use cases in the past, I mean, I guess maybe it's more difficult to call it extreme transaction processing. It might be regular transaction <laughs> processing for more firms than uh, than we think. So, yeah, great history, Irfan. And so, you know, this was a Sybase ASE technology that was specifically tuned and built for these this particular purpose. This was a real niche for Sybase back in the day. The announcement that we had in early April where we've launched the SAP uh, Sybase ASE engine as a service for all HANA Cloud customers, obviously that's great for existing ASE customers. They can now run you know, their applications on premises in the cloud hybrid. But as you said, this extreme transaction processing is now open to everybody. That is correct. Yes, indeed. And and maybe just to put a finer point on, on why is it that something that would allegedly be, you know, 10, 15 years old and was able to drive a certain profile of applications back in the era of, you know, some of those larger financial institutions, why would that technology be equally relevant today, knowing that, you know, the world has gone cloud native, there's a plethora of different databases that are out there. Why is it maybe and this is like I can kind of be a little bit sort of, um, you know, presumptuous on my questions here, right? That customers may be thinking or prospects may be thinking is why ASE today? And maybe let me just address that if I may, uh, Neil, from my right. side. I mean, one of the core, core sort of hallmarks of, uh, of Sybase's implementation of a relational transactional database, which are still equally fit for purpose today, was the manner in which it managed resources. Now, in fact, the, the ASC, the Adaptive Server Enterprise Architecture, was driven by something called virtual server architecture. And, and what we implied back in the day, and as I said, is equally implicable today, is that think about the resources that you use in a transactional or an extreme transaction processing environment. You have a large number of users. You have a large number of transactions. 
you have a large number of potential entities and coherency requirements where with concurrent users, some doing maybe analytics or even sort of rudimentary analytics, and those that were perhaps doing very extreme transaction processing, there's a lot of locking that goes on at the database level. So concurrency is a big issue. Then you think about resources, right? Managing memory and disks and disk positionings and all that kind of stuff in a historical sense. This is why Sybase implemented its database using this virtual server architecture. And one of the real benefits of, of Sybase back in the day, and is it equally applicable today, is its frugal way in, it, in, the, way, in the way it manages hardware. And if you think back in the day, when, and even today for that matter, when you run a benchmark scenario, and these are typically in the database world, these will be you know, well-audited type of benchmarks like a TPC-C benchmark or a TPC-D benchmark in, in analytics, what, what tended to happen is that some of the vendors used to really get carried away and they would throw a lot of hardware and, and try to emphasize that hardware was really the source of solving the problem. Whereas Sybase's approach was actually, I wouldn't say the inverse of that, but it certainly would scale out horizontally as well. But more often than not, you could actually get a lot more value. And, and, and sometimes the old cliche, you know, do more with less. Well, actually, Sybase was really the poster child of doing that, because even in a relatively small footprint of hardware and the virtual server architecture that Sybase was, was driven by, you could essentially drive a lot more throughput. And, and that's really the hallmark of even current day in, in essentially in the cloud native world and now bringing in the HANA cloud plus the ASE service. We're still able to use the hardware infrastructure in a much more frugal way, get a lot more throughput in a smaller footprint of service and equally so start scaling out when we start combining topics like, you know, the data uh, lake and other topics in just a moment as well. So in a, in a nutshell, historically, what was implemented, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, in some cases, uh, that architecture was so ahead of its time. And even if we apply it to today's kind of problem space, high, high kind of requirements around lots of data, lots of concurrent users, and the implementation that was, was implemented all those years ago, and running it even in the infrastructure of an AWS, a Google, or even a, a Microsoft, you will get a substantial t TCO saving using Sybase ASE as a service or HANA Cloud as a service today. Thanks. It really is a, a, a strong arrow in the uh, HANA Cloud quiver, this new extreme transaction processing service, which is HANA Cloud SAP Adaptive Server Enterprise a service that's the new one that's uh that's out. Um, <clears throat> let's move on to the other services that your team has been uh has been delivering as well and uh, the launch of the new technologies around data lakes now again one of these technologies was based on an old uh, an existing sybase engine uh, sap sybase iq but there's also a couple of other services these new services are going to add significant power to the ability to build and manage and get value from a data lake. Um, do you want to introduce uh, the audience to some of these new services, please? Yes, certainly. Um, so just maybe in, in, in order. So IQ uh, is, a, um, is a relational data lake, which is now effectively the cold store or the cool store for HANA Cloud, as, as you uh, and our listeners would have appreciated now since our architectural shift separating out a compute and store architecture now for HANA Cloud, IQ essentially becomes a data storage tier and a mass storage lake if you choose to use IQ. But equally so, you know, you can use and adopt any one of the hyperscalers mass storage lakes, you know, whether that's S3 on AWS or BigQuery or, or Azure or SQL data lake as well. Now, specifically from the, the services that we're adding, right, we've got IQ to be used as a, uh, as, a, as a cold data lake, as a cold mass storage lake. But the other two services are quite interesting. We've got SQL on files where, you know, we do see a lot of customers still wanting to do processing of documents and trying to determine uh, insight and gain insight from a larger number of, of documents, whether that's unstructured documents or even semi-structured documents. And now having SQL on files as a service and being a complement to the storage architecture of HANA, it means that you can really look at the most uh, significant environment to do the processing. So, you know, we're talking about the industry shifting towards system of disaggregation now, right, where you take much more of a workload driven approach where you could have maybe the specialist 
storage, economy storage tier used for that document store and being able to use SQL on files to really start pruning the data, taking a look at what's important and then only bring back a subset of what's really important to maybe a, a compute engine like HANA. So you're effectively pushing down the processing to the storage tier, the SQL on file storage tier in this case, and getting a lot more classical value out of a storage technology that deals with that client kind of data storage. And another good example would be the object store, right? So similarly, where you'd want to have a distinction between using a, an economy kind of driven storage architecture where you could have the volume of data, maybe a substantial of data being used in, in a compliant or regulation based application profile. You could really push more of the workload to those, let's call them the cheaper economy scale and storage tier to then be able to then build, build back or only bring back some of the subset of the data that would make sense, right, for maybe a first-class computing foundation like HANA Cloud. So, so really you get the choice as a user and as a developer to really determine the best class of storage. Now, being very, very explicit here, this isn't you're making a decision on either or because the front end is always HANA, HANA Cloud. And whether you choose to use IQ as a data lake, whether you use SQL on files or use the object store, that's really just an implementation on the storage TCO. That's really just giving you choice and flexibility of choice, as opposed to you having to consciously decide where you physically want to store and access the data from. Yeah, th this is a really fascinating area. So um, let's just let me just uh, uh, recap. The the three new services are um, it's called HANA, SAP HANA Cloud, comma Data Lake. Now that's the SAP IQ technology. Is that correct? Irfan? That is correct. That is yep. correct. And then we've got SQL and File, which is a technology that allows you to send requests to HANA Cloud. And then Hannah Cloud can say, okay, these these this data is in semi-structured format in a file, and I've got this new capability, this new service, SQL and files that can go in and interrogate that data for me. And then <clears throat> the third service is it's based on some object uh, store database that we acquired several years ago and now your team have brought that in as a service for data lakes so that you can store objects you know non-relational and other types of objects so those are the three services have i got that correct yes you have indeed and then i think the most important part as you described it is these are storage technologies and the uh, the front door if you want to call it that hana cloud is really what's used to be able to interrogate those stores so from a simplicity and from a an architectural elegance point of view you don't necessarily need to determine where to physically store the data you can access the data somewhat independently and and this is going to be hopefully giving a lot of value add for those specific kinds of and classes of applications that really want to take the best storage framework and storage architecture architecture for the native storage content that they're bringing into their environments. Yeah, now this is very interesting, Irfan, because this is a vision that you have for data lakes that I think is moving the whole concept of data lakes forward. Data lakes in the past have been thought of as big separate blobs of data where you, know, you, you maybe uh, store data you don't know what to do with or stage data. Um, that you need to process or, or work on before you can bring it in and so on. So it was always, data lakes were thought as these separate units, a second copy of the data, you know, because the data hasn't been brought in yet and so on. You've done to data lakes what you did to analytics and transactions with um, merging those two database paradigms together. You know, some I think Gartner used to call it HTAP. So you, your team have said, OK, there's a workload for transactions and a workload for analytics. Let's bring those together to a single data set. And HANA and HANA Cloud can do that. And then you said, well, wait a minute, there's also this other workload for data lakes. Why is that a separate thing? Why is that? Why are data lakes not really just part of this bigger vision for data all handled under one thing? So with these new data lake services, not only are you delivering, if customers wanted, a standalone data lake, but you're tying it in so it's it looks like one single data set from end to end. Some of the data is going to be, you know, unprocessed raw data. But you can store that in a HANA Cloud organized data store and 
be able to query it from top to bottom with the correct tools and so on without incurring high costs for storage if you were storing it in memory in HANA. I, I think this is a real game changer. Am I on the right track here? Yeah, no, you summarized it perfectly, uh, Neil, and maybe just to maybe add a couple of additional points for our listeners here. If you think about the way uh, architectural uh, work goes on, in, in, at least on the, on the front end side of a project, you have to make a lot of, uh, I, I would imagine, cast in stone decisions sometimes. Let's just establish a data lake. Let's move all our data with either ETL or ELT processing and move that data at mass into these environments, which, by the way, is a project that either never completes or, or either runs short, right, in terms of not getting quite all of the data into one location. And then by the by virtue of those hard and fast decisions that are taken at the project inception point, you end up making compromises because some data may either may either qualify or maybe it doesn't qualify, in which case then you don't really transition or, or have a data to value conversation. What you're doing is you're narrowing the scope of what your project can actually deliver on. And our, and our vantage point here is that, you know, unlike maybe, and this is not a criticism, but it's a reality, hyperscalers are very much driving the homogenous storage within a single data lake that they will provide to you. Pick any one, pick any combination. If you take a look at the majority of, of application vendors, once again, they want to have the ability and the flexibility to service and support hybrid environments. So when we took this HANA cloud services driven approach, where you can have the independence of storage and compute, and you could use the, the specialist foundation in store with the economical TCO kind of capabilities that you would desire. And then you combine that with another couple of facets here. This, the first point would be semantic modeling, right? Where you can actually build a model, which in itself goes across on-premise, whether it's gonna be in a public cloud, open source, or whether it's gonna be running even in a private cloud and have a single access point to all that data and have a single semantic layer built on top, that is a very powerful foundation. And the second part of the, the equation that we're also dealing with as well is we're seeing this hugely decentralization of data taking place, right? And what I mean by that is you, can, you, have, the, you have the China scale where you have large amounts of data stored either centrally or having to be you know, scaled essentially from a distributed type of processing where you run lots of different parallel activities to just keep up with the amount of data. And then the decentralized case where this could well be, take Tesla, for example, a great example. Tesla is effectively, you know, taking a lot of data that you're, you're generating through maybe autonomous driving or even in the vehicle itself, uh, you know, telemetry type of data. And it's using the back end, maybe the data lake in a classical, even hyperscaler environment to just train the models. Right. And then you would actually do the processing effectively at the edge. And having, for example, even your iPhone, your smartphone is a good example as well. You know, you have AI running on the smartphone generating memories, which is effectively all the videos and, you know, pictures that you store on the smartphone. So therefore, processing is taking place absolutely at the edge. And our vantage point is with a metadata and a, and a semantic layer that you can build, knowing that, you know, processing is becoming more decentralized, knowing that you're going to have speciality data stores and, of course, for that matter, data lakes, which will store a large amount of data and having a HANA cloud service, which runs on any environment, any of the hyperscaler environments for that matter and on-prem, it really gives you a far more greater way of being able to navigate, explain and have a high level of understanding of where your data is and then build the new generation use cases across the entire breadth of your data, not as I described where some customers are just narrowing the scope of their projects. This is going to be a pivot point in data lake technology and the thinking behind data lakes. This is fantastic stuff, Erfan. Thank you so much for introducing uh, this to us today. So we're sort of towards the end of our time here. You know, I just want to thank Erfan. Uh, he introduced us to the new technologies, the extreme transaction processing technology for HANA Cloud customers uh, that can handle very high ingest data uh, needs and handle that in real time, very low latency. And also these three new services for data lakes that really are going to revolutionize the way that uh, data is handled within data lakes. It's bringing the data and data lakes right into, as, as Irfan says, the, the semantics of the rest of the uh, data in the organization. Any last comments, Irfan? No, just a pleasure to speak to you again, Neil. I hope that all our listeners are safe and well. And, um, you know, I, I think that the services that we've just brought out 
albeit these are services built with a high integrity from from uh, several years ago, are still equally impl- you know applicable today. I would encourage you all to evaluate and and trial some of these new services. I think you'll be quite surprised in terms of how how significant they could be to your your existing and and of course your new architectures. Excellent. And on that note, um, we do have some trials available. We'll have a I, I believe there'll be a, a new trial for the data lake coming out towards the end of 2021. But these services are available today and they're priced just with the HANA consumption unit pricing model that you're all used to. So you don't need to, to sign anything up. You, If you're a HANA Cloud customer with HANA Cloud uh, consumption units, you're ready to rock and roll with these new services. Thank you so much again, Arfan. Talk to you soon, buddy.